Welcome to today's webinar, Reconnecting Our Brains, One Cell at a Time. You can resize the windows on the webinar portal at any time. I'm Richard Wingate, Head of Anatomy at King's College London. I'll be moderating the webinar today, and during this presentation, you'll learn how you can find and make brain cells in the spaces all around you. So why a neuron or a brain cell? The discovery of the brain cell was the key event that launched neuroscience 140 years ago. Brain cells come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes, but almost all are organized around a simple principle that information flows in one direction from dendrites with the receivers of the signals through the cell body and then along a single output called the axon, which can branch to multiple different areas. And that's what we're going to make today and what you're going to make today. We're also going to learn about the power of outreach and the power of brain awareness as a positive social tool. You don't have to have the materials to hand right now, uh, but we do want you to sit down for 10 minutes after this presentation and make a brain cell. Photograph it and post it to show us your brain cell. Hashtag show us your brain cell. We'll give you this handle again at the end of the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, we will also address questions that you might have. And those audience submitted questions will be uh, sent to the presenters at the end of our presentation. So just before we get started, um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of some of the amazing resources that BrainFacts.org has available to you. You can see on the home page that BrainFacts has five broad topic areas along the top with a multiple of articles in each category. Neuroscience and Society has content related to technology and arts effects on the brain, as well as special materials for educators. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Bill Grizar, Greiser, sorry, Bill, and Jeff Leek are the founders of Northwest Noggin. It's a neuroscience outreach group based in Portland, Oregon. It's a robust, creative, volunteer-driven, nonprofit organization that brings scientists and artists and students of all ages together to contribute their expertise listen and learn from others, enthuse young people about science and art, share area education resources, and inform and excite the public about ongoing neuroscience research. So uh, without further ado, let's hear from Bill and Jeff. Richard, thank you Great. very, very much for introducing us. We really appreciate this. And thanks, everybody, for participating in this kind of unusual, you know, online, you know, kind of webinar format. Both Jeff and I are teachers, um, we're educators, so we like to get in front of a classroom, you know, be standing up and walk around, et cetera. But, you know, we're getting used to this kind of online format. And as Richard suggested, um, we are gonna talk today about, let's see if I can find this here, uh, push to audience, art and brains and outreach. Uh, and how to do this actually, how to reach communities and reach audiences um, during a pandemic. Um, we have a, uh, with a COVID-19 made out of pipe cleaners up here with all the, you know, specific proteins that, you know, coded service and make it such a, a, a risk to us. So a pandemic is a traumatic, you know, kind of, uh, you know, dramatic kind of experience, a blow to all of us. And we've now been sort of, you know, separated out into these, you know, separate rooms you know, all over and by in neurons are, you know, known to be remarkably what we call plastic, where they can sort of, um, you know, recover tremendously, reach out again, you know, and form new connections. So this was our effort to try to, you know, think of how we might, you know, try to reconnect to some extent. And as Richard mentioned, we would really like you guys to, to think about, you know, what around you looks like a neuron uh, and, you know, uh, uh, and then share them as a way to sort of synapse, to, to relink up and connect, uh, you know, uh, across the world. So my name is Bill Greiser, and I teach um, neuroscience at Portland State University uh, in the Department of Psychology and also at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University in the Department of Behavioral Neuroscience. 
Um, and Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself too, please? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm Jeff Leek, and uh, I'm actually an artist, not a neuroscientist. And But uh, um, uh, I, t I teach up at Portland State University along with Bill. In fact, he and I actually teach several art and neuroscience courses there, and I have a great interest in the intersection between art and science. So we, as Richard mentioned, you know, co-founded this organization called Northwest Noggin. And basically, we were teaching at multiple institutions at the time. And we decided, you know, we have all these terrific students. We were working with graduate students who were studying, you know, aspects of the brain and behavior and receiving, you know, federal funding to do this in the United States. Um, and we had undergraduates who were really excited about, you know, what makes us who we are and, you know, what is the actual underlying, you know, physiology of, of us. Um, and so we decided, you know, that there were so many places, you know, that don't typically get, you know, information about, you know, this funded research, um, you know, with a lot of K-12 public schools. I mean, BrainFax is doing tremendous work actually providing all these resources to make, you know, this knowledge more available. But you know, oftentimes we found there were not a lot of institutions that were reaching out to what they call academic priority classrooms, like classrooms where, you know, um, they didn't have a lot of resources. Um, and so we just decided we'd go volunteer. So we started putting together, you know, these outreach, you know, visits, and we learned pretty quickly um, how important it is to listen to other people. Like we were not going to come in as like, hey, we're the experts, you know, on everything about the brain. You know, everybody's got one. Uh, each one of us has, you know, as an adult, about 86 billion neurons. Um, and they've wired up, you know, based on really remarkable, unique experiences that we've all had. Um, and we can learn a lot, you know, by listening and then, you know, telling stories and connecting, you know, figuring out where our research intersects with what people have experienced. Um, so this was really the sort of genesis uh, of Northwest Noggin. And Jeff, you want to talk about how, you know, really the the arts are a critical component of this, right? Yeah, so I, uh, one of the uh, things that uh, since we began this uh, uh, program, we've sort of maintained it as, a, as an art and neuroscience uh, outreach. And um, uh, art was important to us, um, certainly because it can be an engaging way to learn. Uh, uh, it can uh, be a, an accessible way to uh, um, approach uh, uh, sometimes rather complex concepts, um, but also really uh, what we were more and more as we went along, we found that it was a kind of a fundamental way in which we learn or can learn. Um, uh, and one of the things that we try to do is give people um, uh, uh, um, things in a way that they can explore concepts uh, rather than just being told about them or, or rather than just being, uh, you know, um, uh, have, having to have a sort of singular uh, uh, answer or approach to something. And art is a, a re really um, ideal way to, to do that uh, because it can it can accommodate a really diverse range of approaches and solutions and um, but however well you don't necessarily need say one right answer to any any uh, problem um, the process of art uh, really um, uh, often requires a, a deeper understanding of what you're trying to represent so um, so uh, and one, uh, one of the things we hope to show you today, uh, or, or at least uh, get people kind of thinking about is, uh, you know, how you might do that, uh, you know, how you could give people things in a way that, that they could focus then on, say, what that thing actually does rather than the bits and pieces of it. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the things that's become kind of more and more important for us is that um, art is a, a really great way to communicate um, ideas and concepts, but not only that, uh, it's a great way to communicate something about yourself and who you are to other people. And um, that uh, um, 
uh, we're finding particularly now that we're uh, more separated, that's a really great way to sort of bring us all closer to each other. So one of the, the driving forces behind these efforts is the, the, the strong realization that all this work that's being funded by often by public agencies, by, by, by the public, by people, you know, um, actually on things like sleep in the brain or anxiety in the brain, depression in the brain, you know, ADHD in the brain, you know, uh, development of the brain, perception of the brain, drugs, including alcohol, you know, um, memory in the brain, language in the brain, racial bias in the brain is is extraordinarily relevant to, you know, our circumstances and our world. Um, and people are inherently interested in all of this. So one of the things we found was that when we took our grad students and our undergrads out, you know, into homeless youth shelters, um, you know, youth correctional facilities, you know, K-12 public schools, you know, the, actually Congress, we went all over the place. I mean, we found that there was extraordinary interest in this. We would have people who would be asking questions, staying late, you know, participating, you know, for much longer than, you know, their teachers or, you know, other other folks that were set helping us set this up would would feel would happen. So that was that was pretty extraordinary. What we do, you know, what 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 scientists do actually has, you know, significant relevance. And as I mentioned, you know, we all pay for this research. So it's I feel as a recipient of um you know, an NRSA, like a grant to help do my research in the United States, that it is contingent upon me to actually give something back. Um, if you get publicly funded <laughs> to go to grad school, you should be, you know, out there in the public explaining what it is that you do uh, and helping others to do the same. So that's really a big part of the mission. We all pay for this research and we should all be benefiting and learning about how to participate in it ourselves. Um, so let me see here. OK. Um, and these connections, it turns out, are extraordinarily powerful. We find there's greater understanding of the research, like in uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest, where we go to a lot of these different schools. We're, we're blown away now by you know, some of the, the, the schools that we've gone to you know, again and again and again, or some of the places we've gone to more and more you know, over the years. We've been doing this since 2012. And how much understanding there is of neurons, of glial cells, of you know uh, synapses, of networks that are involved in cognition and perception and behavior. Uh, there's also tremendously increased and enhanced support, you know, for public investment in research. So we've gone, you know, was you know all far afield, rural areas, you know, all over the place to make it clear that just because you know there's sometimes um, these big urban centers are where a lot of the research dollars may be flowing the the information and the access to uh you know educational opportunities or job opportunities that could be generated from this investment in research is um universal is it is interest in it all over um we get increased participation then people who didn't know about this or didn't think this was an option for them you know to go explore how the brain underlies our you know who we are you know, realize that I, yeah, I could potentially do that. There's a huge part of the fact that you've got, you know, young people, uh, you know, lots of undergrads and grad students and postdocs who are appearing in these places. And, you know, they can sort of see each other and say like, okay, I, I might be able to do that. I could do that too. There's somebody who looks like me, who, 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 who I could see myself being, you know, um, in the future. So that increased participation is critical. Less confirmation bias. Like one of the things we found is that oftentimes in these lab settings or you know in an academic department, there's like a lot of the same people. I mean, people who have had similar sorts of you know experiences on their way to getting you know into these places, and you know it is challenging and it is important to actually uh, you know not to recognize the biases that we have when we you know put together research proposals when we start to investigate you know, certain aspects of how the brain works. We need more voices uh, and less bias, basically, in the, the conduct of, of research, you know, education, teaching, and outreach. And also, you often can find remarkable new directions. I mean, like, you have, you know, people in a middle school class, you know, that'll the kid will say something that'll that'll really make you think, like, wow, that's a great idea. We didn't, I don't think anybody's thought of that. <laughs> so you have, like, remarkable you know, investigators here uh, that, that, you know, it, it, it's good to get exposed to. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things is we, we bring, as you can see from some of these images, you know, all sorts of, 
you know, materials like, you know, this is a, a black bear skull from Oregon that we dissected actually. Um, and we can show them, you know, this is where your auditory nerve goes right here. There's a hole. This is where your cochlea, this is where, where you know, the, the, the cells that are gonna, you know, convert the sound waves. They're located in this little bubble of bone, you know, right below here. So they can sort of see it becomes much more real. And, you know, it certainly helps to have, for example, an actual human brain as well, right? Where you can show, you know, where the networks are that are important for attention or decision-making or where you're feeling anxiety or where you're perceiving what you're seeing and things like that. So these connections are really powerful and they matter uh, we believe, you know, quite a bit. So just to give you a, an overview, we, we um, work with, um, you know, academic priority, K-12, urban, rural communities, tribal majority schools um, in Oregon as well, um, houseless youth. There's a homeless youth center called PEAR that we bring brains to, you know, all the time. Incarcerated youth. Uh, we go to the McLaren Youth Correctional Facility in Oregon. Uh, there's a women's correctional facility uh, young graduate researchers, undergraduates, you know, from various area institutions to try to leverage all the resources that we've got in this region. Um, artists, uh, painters, dancers, storytellers, musicians, poets, um, area businesses. You know, we have Intel, which makes all sorts of computer chips. They're very interested, uh, you know, in, you know, uh, what we're learning about the brain, actually, and how it might relate to the development of some of their products. Um, and then members of the public, right? So we have lots and lots of folks that are kind of getting involved. Jeff. <laughs> so I, uh, I have one example of uh, another, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, I'll show you some more in a few, few minutes, but uh, uh, as one example of a project that we've done before, and I actually I should, I, I do wanna kind of preface this by saying that um, uh, one of the things that we hope uh, that comes out of this, you know, it, I certainly we want to enthuse people about uh, science, uh, but we're also hoping that uh, you might see something in this and how we do things that you can uh, uh, use in your own community. So um, uh, um, get out there and connect with people uh, 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 as well. Um, so, I, and uh, this is a sort of an interesting project to me because, um, in, in part, uh, uh, you know, all, all of the things that we end up doing, you you have, you do have to take the the um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, circumstances of the uh, outreach that you're doing in in. Uh, into account, you know. So, in this case, um, we were we we actually had uh, sort of set up a, a kind of uh, event at Pair, the homeless youth center, um, uh, where we were bringing in uh, people who were doing research on things like sleep and addiction and uh, um, uh, uh, other areas that um, uh, the. Um, uh, the youth there had expressed interest in. And then also we invited in policy, local policymakers to, uh, to, to that space too, so that they could see not only the research, but, but the youth themselves. So um, in this case, I had several weeks leading up to that to work with these kids. So what I did is I, I had brought in a bunch of uh, uh, plaster uh, cast brains um, and uh, we all sculpted out uh, landscapes on these brains. Um, and and uh, these landscapes uh, um, uh, were uh, sort of uh, relayed something about the, their uh, um, aspirations, the places uh, they would like to go, and also the places that they had been. Um, so it really was about uh, a landscape about them that they were building out on this brain. And that was a kind of an interesting thing for me because it it gave us an opportunity while we were sitting around the table making these things to discuss with them, you know, uh, you know, concepts that they were interested in, like uh, 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 memory and emotion and, and, you know, how some of those things work, but also um, really, uh, kind of significantly once they had made those things and we were able to display them and bring all those uh, people in into that space 
um, it, it really uh, um, uh, sent a powerful message uh, about um, them as human beings. Uh, and it makes it really, when you see artwork uh, that is expressive like that, it makes it really hard to kind of look past and dehumanize the, the maker of that work. So um, that was actually really kind of uh, one of the more powerful sort of aspects of that. And one of the things that we kind of took from that uh, and try to introduce to uh, things that we have people make now. Yeah, it was it was very powerful because kids would tell us that, you know, why is it that somebody could walk by like a 15 year old kid mm -hmm. on the street who is in obvious distress and not reach out or not offer any assistance or not respond? And they said they often felt like they were being looked past or looked at as if they were some kind of an object as opposed to a fellow human being. And so um, we actually, as Jeff mentioned, like looked at research that that explored this this phenomenon of dehumanized perception where people actually there are networks in the brain that should be active when you see somebody else, you know, and you you sort of empathize or connect with them. Um, and these were not active in those who were shown images of what they called extreme outgroups, um, including, um, you know, houseless youth. Um, so we had learned that, you know, if you like, again, if you have art, you know, that somebody has created, you start talking about these people as fellow human beings. All of a sudden they saw these kinds of, you know, changes in the brain that reflected connection. Um, and it was very powerful. And the kids were, you know, absolutely like equal participants in this particular event. They were very excited about it. They worked on these brains for a long time. Uh, and it was all around actually how sleep is so Im Im like incredibly important for, you know, mental health. Um, and, you know, you cannot expect people, you know, to engage in whatever behavior you're trying to expect here if they don't have a, have a, have a safe and secure you know, sort of place to lay their head. So that was a very powerful kind of an experience. Other very powerful experiences for us has been to leave, you know, the city, leave Portland and go. You know, we, we can go very far afield here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we would visit, you know, communities with much smaller populations. And we would spend days at a time. We, we made relationships with, um, we reached out and connected synapsed. We call these uh, synaptic community connections with teachers um, you know, and sometimes the principal at different schools and the teachers often put us up um, in their homes and they we have we, we make dinner and they, they, they brought in baby goats into the classroom and things like this. And then we talk about brains and we talk about what they already know, what they're interested in knowing, what they want to know about brains. And we we learn a lot about what, you know, is um, what, what really excites them about the research that's being pursued. And, you know, we also let them know they can they can join us or they can participate. Right. So that's been very powerful. The other very powerful, you know, kind of outreach that we've been doing more recently is with youth correctional facilities. So the McLaren Youth Correctional Facility in Woodburn, Oregon, um, we brought, you know, brains in there as well. It was quite interesting going through the, <laughs> the whole metal detector system with a with a with a ton of brains. And they, we, would you like us to take these out? And they were like, no, 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 keep them in. Uh, but it was a, a fantastic um, experience because there were a lot of kids there that were very interested in why, you know, they had more interaction with police, for example, um, and why, you know, the the um, why there is a there's a field of legal marijuana, for example, outside of the McLaren Youth uh, Correctional Facility that they can smell inside. And for many of these kids, their initial, you know, interaction with law enforcement was was around you know, possession of small amounts of marijuana. So this was, I mean, there was a lot about bias in the brain, a lot about decision-making in the brain, about, about a lot about adolescent brain development, um, that th these kids were very interested in learning how that should influence public policy around youth offense, youth offenders. Um, and so uh, we've been going back and back there multiple times um, and making art with a lot of these kids and, uh, you know, discussing their experiences and learning a great deal you know, about, um, you know, the brain and behavior. So, okay. And then of course we go to society for neuroscience conferences or we try to, um, and, uh, at SFN conferences, we, uh, on a couple occasions, we, right, Jeff, we had a, uh, an art of neuroscience table with tons and tons of, uh, pipe cleaners and, you know, 
scientists would come and they would they would actually uh, craft some of the most specific neurons that we've ever seen. <laughs> it's actually really remarkable, or just this particular receptor or something. But in addition to you know attending sessions and making art at the conference, we also leave the conference. So we you know spent an entire day with the uh, seven hundred you know, students at uh, Turner Elementary School in Washington, D.C., for example. We went to several um, schools over several days in San Diego, uh, San Diego public school system. Um, this past um, fall, we were at the neuroscience conference in Chicago, and we went and worked with over 500 kids from Chicago public schools, uh, along with the Society for Social Neuroscience and SFN. So we had a, uh, we've had a pretty remarkable you know, uh, outreach. We like to go out and leave the conference and bring all that knowledge that's convening on a particular city, you know, out into the community to make more of these connections. And also when we go to DC, which, you know, we're apparently on the docket for, right, for the fall, but we will see, uh, we've we've tried to, to also reach policymakers at the federal level. So um, we gave a couple of uh, congressional neuroscience and STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, uh, caucus briefings um, in the House, actually, uh, to make it clear that we'd like research to inform public policy. And we were told, actually, Earl Blumenauer is the um, the, the Democratic co-chair of the House Neuroscience uh, Caucus, actually, he's in our region, uh, that his staff said this is one of the most well-attended, you know, they had Republicans and Democrats actually in the room making neurons and, you know, <laughs> trying to synaptically connect, right? So that's our, that's our hope in terms of reconnection as well. Okay, Jeff, brain cells. Okay. <laughs> sure. I, I actually want to um, uh, show you a couple of the, the uh, 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 projects that we make. So I have a kind of a brief uh, uh, demo uh, that I, I want to do. Um, uh, this is our pipe cleaner neuron. And, and you can see we've got uh, tons of examples. These are actually, these are all different ones that students actually made. So um, uh, you can see they can get really big or, or uh, they can be more complex. Um, you know, there's a lot you can actually do with these. In fact, um, I, I, it's a, uh, one of the things I like about this particular project is that it is extremely flexible in terms of, you know, how complex you want to be, how specific you want to be, or how simple you want to be with it. And I made this uh, with everyone from kindergartners up to uh, Congress members. So you can do this, you know, uh, uh, in most uh, uh, kind of situations. So um, I'm just going to show you the basics of this. Uh, and think of it uh, as like a sort of um, skeleton uh, uh, that you can kind of add on to, uh, uh, you know, make more complex, make more specific. Um, as you go along. Uh, now, um, if you happen to have pipe cleaners with you, you're welcome to uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, make these with me. Um, and we'd love to, certainly love to see what you come up with uh, if you do. Uh, if not, um, keep it in mind for later, you know, so this is a pretty quick and easy way, uh, um, you know, to, to do these things. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to start out with, uh, you know, about 20 or so pipe cleaners. Now, you can see they can get quite complex, so you might want to invest in a larger bag or something if you want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make these more complicated. So um, now I want to start out. Usually what I do, I'm going to get a basic one here just to show you. Usually what I do is I start out with... Uh, the cell body here, so this big round part on top. So this is the cell body, sometimes called the soma, which is just the Greek word for body. Um, and that's the part of the neuron that, that contains the nucleus and the, the DNA in there that tells the cell what it's actually going to be or the parts it's going to make. Uh, so I grab three pipe cleaners. I'm gonna line them up, I'm gonna hold them in the middle you guys can all see that. And then I'm going to take them and twist them about three times in the middle, just enough to hold them all together. So 
when I do these in classes, a lot of times I just like to tell people they've made some cat whiskers. So uh, you've got your cat whiskers here, but you want to make that into a cell body. So what I do is I take each end and I fold it in half. And then all these ends here, I twist together. And so you've made kind of a loop. And in order to make that into a three-dimensional kind of uh, cell sort of shape, I just take the sides of this and I pull them out and kind of squish it up. And then you have kind of a little you know, light bulb sort of shape here. So this is my cell body. Now, the next thing I usually like to make on these are uh, this uh, long sort of wire uh, um, structure here, which is the axon of the neuron. And that's the part of the neuron that, the, that sends an electric signal from one end, from the cell body end, to the other, to this terminal end. So uh, in order to do that, I just take two pipe cleaners. There are a lot of ways you could do this. Um, the simple way for me is just to take two pipe cleaners and then twist them together from top to bottom. So all the way, and it makes kind of a nice pattern and it gives you a little uh, uh, thicker of a kind of wire form to start with so you can add more stuff to it later if you want. Now, if you're feeling particularly fancy with these, then you can take three or four and braid them together, which I do sometimes, or um, there are a lot of other ways you can do this, but basically you want kind of a wire sort of uh, form. So this axon, what I want to do is just attach it to my cell body. And I have a kind of a handy stem on my cell body here, so I just wrap this around that. Uh, just enough so that it is kind of firmly held on. So as long as it's your cell body's not flying off of your uh, axon, then you've done pretty well. And you can actually make this part a uh, sort of nice start to a uh, axon hilla, which is the uh, the uh, top part of that uh, axon leading from the cell body. So, um, so once I've done that, what I want to do is make the ends of my neuron. So this is uh, the ends of these neuron uh, are the axon terminal. And uh, the axon terminal to the, the part of the neuron that actually they store what we call a neurotransmitter, like uh, if you've ever heard of dopamine or serotonin, you know, norepinephrine, all of that stuff. And um, uh, uh, when that electric signal reaches the ends of those axons, they'll release those chemicals um, uh, into, a, into a gap between neurons called a synapse. So the axon terminals, I usually just take three or so pipe cleaners, and then I'm gonna take my, the end of my axon here, and if you guys can all see that, and I'm gonna just wrap it around the, those three pipe cleaners. And this was just a really quick way for me to get kind of a lot of tentacles off of the end of my axon here. So now, um, uh, it, it, because like a kind of weird helicopter or something, um, what I usually do is I just take these and kind of uh, kind of squish them around so that they're bent and, and they kind of go all over the place. Sometimes you can you can just curl them around your finger if you want something a little more uh, stylized. Uh, but just, I I usually don't like them sticking straight out. So this looks a little more organic and neuron-like. And so, um, so those are my terminals. And uh, the last part I usually show people um, is uh, the top part of this neuron, which are the dendrites of the neuron. And this is uh, these axon terms release the chemical into the synapse. Synapse kind of comes right up to these uh, um, dendrites. 
dendrites, and those chemicals actually will bind to the dendrites. And if you get enough of them bound uh, to those dendrites, it will either tell this, the neuron to send a signal on to the next neuron or sometimes to stop sending a signal. So it can be kind of an on or off response to that. Um, but that's basically how neurons communicate with each other. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to make these, and we're, I'm going to kind of do it sort of uh, one. You have to sort of do these one at a time, um, uh, but you want to add as many as you uh, as as you can. So the more dendrites, the better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the simple way to do this. I'm going to take a pipe cleaner. I'm going to stick it halfway through one of these spokes here of my um, of my cell body. And I'm going to fold it over, and I'm going to twist it. But I'm going to twist it just part way up. So I'm going to kind of leave it open, so it's sort of a Y kind of shape. And then, like I did with the terminals, I'm going to squish those things around. Uh, and then that'll that'll be a dendrite for me. But a dendrite is a makes a pretty sad neuron. So you want to add like bunches of those. And you can see, you know, uh, you can add quite a few. Um, you can act, and then also one of the things I, I do want to point out, this was just sort of my method for making these. And, and I, I had, a, I was trying to uh, uh, solve a particular problem for me, which was just to, how do I get a lot of people to make uh, uh, models of neurons in a fairly short amount of time. Um, so it may not be the best way to do it for you. So you can actually uh, think about ways that you can uh, adapt this method or change it, uh, or, um, or even uh, uh, expand on it too. So you can see like some of these have more, you know, there's a uh, myelin sheath around this, which uh, you know, so that is the insulation around the the axon. Um, you know, some of these have. Uh, I, I had one here. Here's a cell body uh, with a nucleus made out of a googly eye. You know, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you could sort of express this. We've had people make um, uh, specialized neurons, like a cone cell. You know, or, or, or I'm sorry, rod. This is a not a cone cell. Or uh, yeah, <laughs> Meissner's corpuscles. Yeah, they, uh, uh, from which are uh, touch receptors. You know, all sorts of things. So how far you want to go with it, it is up to you. Um, uh, but I encourage you to go kind of uh, further with it, and also you know, uh, feel free to share the the idea and project with whoever you come across. Sometimes we'll just uh, bring a bunch of pipe cleaners to a pub or something and sit down and make these. So <laughs> it's like knitting. It's very meditative. Um, <laughs> all right. So I, uh, oh, I think we had some more. Uh, uh, Bill wanted to talk about uh, in terms of what we're doing now. Yeah, and then I, then and we could talk about that. I want to talk about the found out how we've updated this project, yeah. right, Jeff. So yeah, we, yeah, the, yeah, one yeah. of the things is we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and again, we've been sort of separated out into separate rooms, like all over the place. Um, and then, uh, you know, for schools, you know, a lot of the schools are, you know, they're they're doing online learning, um, you know, through various platforms. So we reached out um, to some of the teachers that we've worked with before in Portland Public Schools, um, and we, you know, said we'd love to visit and we'd love to show brains. We'd love to take student questions and things, things like that. We'd like to make art as well. So I do want to make a shout out, actually. Um, the Portland Alcohol Research Center up at OHSU has been a tremendous supporter of a lot of these outreach efforts, buying us, you know, the pipe cleaners that we distribute to classrooms, you know, getting the gloves so we can handle real human brains, you know, doing all sorts of fantastic things to support us. Um, and they're funded, of course, by the national or the NIAAA, which is National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism at um, uh, under NIH. Uh, so a, a huge shout out to them. And they, they actually ordered a bunch of pipe cleaners for us to go out to Portland Public Schools to try to make them. But there are issues around, you know, um, privacy and, you know, getting access to addresses and things like that. So we started thinking there's there are other ways, right, we could actually do this, right, mm -hmm. Jeff? So we ended up um, 
with a different kind of a project. But actually, first, I just want to show you in Portland Public Schools, like some of these questions. So we had students actually um, submitted questions in advance, what they'd be interested in. So they have, this is just a list of, you know, what happens to the brain during trauma? You know, uh, you know, why do we, why do we sleep and dream? You know, how do we remember sound? You know, they have like this fantastic questions from kids. Um, and we ended up going um, into the classroom with many of our volunteers on little tiny picture screens. Um, but we were supposed to be there for about an hour in these classes. And we were there almost two hours, you know, uh, you know, once a week for three weeks. So kids would stay after they wanted to ask more questions. They're really interested in the brain. And of course, Jeff, right, they made fantastic art. <laughs> so I, uh, um, I wanted to, we wanted to kind of end with uh, uh, sort, of, sort of how how we kind of, in a way, adapted the, the Neuron Project to, uh, to um, uh, uh, you know, accommodate it the circumstances of our outreach now. And and actually, I, I think there are some really, uh, there are a number of reasons why I really kind of like this uh, approach right now. Um, you know, so basically what we, what we were uh, kind of working on is to say like, since uh, we can't necessarily get materials to uh, students like we normally would, and we don't really know what people have at, at hand, um, why not just take a look around your uh, 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 kind of uh, immediate surroundings or, or take a walk around your neighborhood and, and see um, what it is that you can, you can find that sort of share the, the maybe basic structures of uh, some of these cells that we're talking about or, or, um, or actually even represent the kinds of, uh, uh, or the functions of the parts of that cell. Um, and so we were uh, having people do say, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, kind of versions of this. One in which, you know, you can have people kind of walk around and and photograph things that uh, say you look like neurons. There are neurons all around you. So, and you can you can see uh, uh, different sorts of examples of that. And it's really um, it, it's what's interesting is when you start to actually think about like, oh, what are these things that I'm seeing in this uh, actually represent? So we were starting to kind of label these, and sometimes you can actually go much further than you think. So if you do a little research and you start seeing more and more in, in these in these shapes uh, um, that uh, reflect you know that uh, that type of the cell that you're looking at, um, the other thing we were doing was actually having people just sort of gather the things that you have around you and construct their own neuron out of those things. So, uh, and this was actually a really interesting approach to me because. Um, you can actually gather things around. Uh, you can gather certainly gather things that look like uh, sort of dendrites or axons or axon terminals and assemble those things and, and uh, uh, photograph them. Uh, but you can also um, uh, gather things around uh, you that have say something about you, kind of what what it is uh, you like, what it is you do, what it you know, the things that you're interested in and assemble kind of neurons out of those. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, doing that can actually uh, um, uh, require um, a, a really a kind of deeper understanding of what these uh, cells kind of do. So say if you, if, if you have something that you you're, you say represents an axon for you. If you really start to think about like, well, why does that represent an axon? You have to really understand what that axon does. You know, how does it act? You know, uh, uh, what's a they say for example, an action potential? You know, what uh, um, you know, and how does that actually happen? How would you how would you represent that uh, it, with an object? Uh, you know, so. 
depending on what you want to do, you can go fairly deep into these things and, and really think about like what these things are, what they represent. Uh, so uh, one of our thoughts with this was to kind of encourage uh, people to go out, um, uh, look at your surroundings, see what you can kind of come up with with these, uh, um, uh, put together your own neuron that is sort of like a maybe even kind of a self-portrait as a neuron and then share it with us we you know we have a we have kind of a hashtag uh, show us your brain cell what well, you know we really like to sort of use this as a way to uh um uh, uh kind of communicate our our sort of enthusiasm for for uh science and also to just uh kind of uh, bring us together around a kind of uh, a common sort of uh, idea. So, you know, make your brain cell, you know, have, have, uh, have a, uh, be creative with it, you know, uh, yeah, make yeah, it out of just... things that are interesting to you. Yeah. I was going to say Running. any brain cell, any brain cell too, right? You want, you want well, to read through this list? Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> that's the, the other thing is that it's really kind of interesting to, with, with these is that, you know, you can, you can, make the sort of archetype of a brain cell that we were talking about. But if, if you want to do so, look up some other types of cells, you know, um, they, these are incredibly interesting little machines. And uh, um, uh, some of them are going to be really fascinating to you. Say uh, you might be more interested in vision. Uh, so you might want to, uh, you might want to think about like, you know, how does that work? You know, what's a, what does a cone cell actually do? Uh, a Meissner's corpuscle like we have here, you know, that sort of touch receptor, you know, how does that work? They're really fascinating. Uh, uh, hair cells, uh, you know, they're like little, uh, you know, levers hanging off of that. So they're really interesting. And the more of these you look, look up, you know, the more you'll see around you that uh, could actually represent those different things. Yeah, you can find neurons anywhere. <laughs> yeah, there's a bird poop in neurons. So. <laughs> so, Richard, right. do we go to where there are there questions? I I believe there's some time left, right? Or hi, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation, and um, I just wanted to. I, I've made my own. Uh, brain cell when I disappear from the screen there, so uh, oh, this, nice. this is mine. <laughs> and, uh, I also wanted to just, just sort of congratulate you on the reach um, of your of your outreach. You're you're going to so many different places and engaging so many different people with so many people, different people. And I absolutely love the found uh, brain cell. So please, uh, anyone out there who hasn't had a chance to make a brain brain cell during the presentation, you can go outside now and and see if you can find your own brain cell. And yeah. please. Please, please, hashtag show us your brain cell. So we do have some questions. And um, I'm just going to give you a few. I think I've got a time for a, a, a couple at least. Um, one here, which I think is uh, kind of speaks from um, the science community. And that's uh, what, what advice do you have for um, professionals, outreach professionals, or outreach interested um, teachers and scientists who face skepticism about the value of outreach from higher ups within their organization. I don't know if you've ever encountered that. Oh, um, but yeah. I know it's <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, oftentimes institutions, it's kind of amazing. We were at one campus that they were much more interested in having like a big grant so they could put on a SciTalk conference and, you know, and basically bring in other science professionals and then talk to each other. And, you know, it, it, it Part of it is if you're going to be doing science communication, you just got to do it. And so, you know, one of the things that's it's been so remarkable and rewarding for us is actually um, just to say, hey, you want to go to the school or, you know, we have a whole bunch of students that are studying the brain and behavior. Um, you know, why don't we just can we come in and bring some brains and, you know, make some art and see what you guys already know about brains or what you're interested in. So a huge part of it is just kind of um, reaching out yourself initially and not worrying about the institutional you know, kind of backing and support because institutions move rather slow. And so <laughs> you got to demonstrate to some extent. Um, and then, um, you know, one of the our approach, right, Jeff, is we go and we we sort of say, hi, you know, I, I teach this or I study this. And, you know, we introduce ourselves yeah. and then 
you know, then automatically you start getting, wow, you study, you know, vision in the brain. Well, how do I, you know, why do I mm -hmm. get these weird spots or why you know, they, they have all these questions all of a sudden that are really fascinating. Um, I study sleep in the brain. Oh, you know, I've had these you know weird dream experiences. And I mean, it, it, all of a sudden you have a conversation and then you have all these materials that you brought and also made and constructed that you can bring into the classroom and you know, then we do a project and, the, and we break into smaller groups. And so we have even more kind of unique conversations in, you know, smaller groups. So just doing it, okay, I think, so is that, really the answer. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to interrupt you there, because that feeds really nicely into another question here, which is, you know, do you, how do you start your lessons? How do you bridge that gap of maybe uh, no knowledge in your, in your audience uh, for your lesson mm -hmm. to some knowledge? Um, do you present information about neurons or do you just start with a conversation? Jeff, you want to? You know, actually, we do. Sometimes we'll just, uh, sometimes we'll actually start with a really quick uh, project. I mean, the pipe cleaners are really great for something like that because it gets your hand in something. And then uh, you, you can kind of go over the basic structures of it um, and then uh, leave it at the basic structures and then just start a conversation while people are actually, you know, just. Uh, um, making things, uh, and it's a very informal sort of process. And, and it, it, you know, well, a lot of times uh, that's kind of an easier way to sort of break into um, uh, then starting to ask questions about, like, you know, well, uh, um, uh, you know, say, you know, you've gone over the basic structure of neurons, but then uh, there may be some questions about how drugs actually act on those those cells, you know, which is, uh, you know, I mean, so there's a lot you can sort of lead into with that. Um, uh, I think the other thing with us, too, is that, um, you know, we we don't have, when we go out places, we don't usually have a lot that we're um, sort of um, uh, planning to uh, uh, teach people about. What we're really doing is responding to their questions and interests. So, you know, we, we uh, re really tend to let the, the whoever we're working with, you know, let them lead the sort of um, uh, 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 conversation. Uh, you know, and you, uh, we found that, that that's a lot uh, sort of richer uh, kind of way to approach it, you know, and, and relevant, you know, to them. So. We, we okay, find so we can actually... Oh, sorry. We said we could, we find we can really actually um, take people pretty far in terms of the knowledge of yeah. their knowledge of the brain. Yeah. You know, it, even in like a, a kindergarten classroom, a first grade classroom. I mean, um, it's pretty remarkable how because they're really interested, and you and you actually have a brain in your hand or something that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that is a follow up question, which is you know, I guess about policymakers. Um, you're doing the same thing with uh, adults. You're doing the same thing uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, how often do you do that, and uh, how does that compare? Yeah, well, not not often enough. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, Jeff said like what, we went from kindergartners up to uh, Congress. We should go the other direction, right? <laughs> so, so, so actually, um, we found that when you actually bring in like a, an actual yeah. human brain, for example, and then you start making art around these topics and then you also let them lead to some extent like mm -hmm. the conversation like what are they interested in you realize that there's sometimes th that there, there's a person there too that that would like to connect and would like to learn something and would like to you know to hear what you're what what you know i mean you know it's interesting because um i know that there's actually some significant bipartisan support for nih funding mm -hmm. um because people really want to know what how, what we're made of and how do we work i mean the, this this is a way we can really get real insight into the nature of our yeah. you know of who we are mm -hmm. and I, I would say the other thing i would say for for us too what what we found when we do things like that when we go up uh, uh into congress or when we actually, even when we had the policymakers uh, come into um, our, our student spaces, the um, what uh, what we at least try to do uh, for Bill and I is just step back and let those let those students do uh, uh, share their experience. 
And that's a much more powerful thing for for uh, people to see than us just trying to, to talk about, you know, kind of ourselves or something. So, right. So how, what, what advice for graduate students who, who might want to get into this? I mean, what's the, what's the best way to approach it? Not every, not every university is lucky enough to have Northwest Noggin uh, operating on its, within its walls. So, so how, how, how would they get involved and how could they start? Well, we found that a lot of places we've gone, like at the University of Oregon, they have very active student groups, Oregon State University, very active student groups that are interested in going out into the community and already you know, doing a lot of the same sort of stuff. And so uh, what we've tried to do with this website too, for example, the nwnoggin.org, is to write a description, like a blog post about every visit that we've made um, and also have a list of resources. So you can get a sense of how we made the connection, you know, where we went, what we heard, mm -hmm. what we learned, what we discovered, what we did. Um, and then, you know, the various projects, including this Found Neuron project, which is now up on right. the website as well. So we're trying to make it as a resource that anybody anywhere could actually, you know, basically utilize. Yeah. Right? Like, like brain I, I also, say, right? <laughs> exactly. I would thank, thank you, you for, for yeah. uh, say like grad students that are really interested in kind of going out in the community and, and uh, engaging the community. I mean, just from our experience, there are, it, it can sometimes be a, a barrier to try and say like contact a school and um, and it, that uh, that's not always maybe the best way to do it. Usually, you know, we, we sort of develop relationships with schools over over time, but there are a couple of ways I think there that might be um, uh, better. One, uh, talk to the teachers directly. Uh, before you go through administration or something, that's really where this sort of enthusiasm is going to come from. Um, and then also, uh, one of the way, way we actually started doing this is we we actually uh, found kind of um, uh, after school groups and things in our area, um, and they really want people to come in. You know, they and uh, they would love to have people come in and. and uh, uh, ad programming like this. Um, and then the other thing that we do, we didn't really talk about it here, uh, but this is something people can do anywhere if they feel like, is we actually do um, uh, um, somewhat, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, semi-monthly or so, um, uh, we have a, a kind of um, uh, 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 lecture program or I guess a presentation kind of that we uh, put on usually at a local sort of uh, pub or cafe or something. And we'll, we'll uh, pair uh, um, uh, a lot of times a grad student or a working scientist, you know, with an artist and we just let them come up with their own presentation together. And uh, we just give them this space. And, you know, that's a really great way to sort of engage the public is and they're always free and open to everyone. So, you know, I, I, I should mention that I should mention that we are actually entirely volunteer. So the yeah. question about like sort of institutional support, we <laughs> we come yeah. Nobody is paid. Everybody is going out. And that's one of the things we've heard from other like sort of institutional outreach programs sometimes is how, you know, how do you get all these students? How, how come all these people are participating? And, you know, we're there at like, you know, a lot of these schools start too early for adolescent brain development. They started like, you know, seven seven thirty in the morning. So we're there, you know, buying mm. coffee and donuts for our volunteers mm. and we're in the classroom and introducing. And uh, I just want to say for folks who want to get involved, it is a joy to do this. It sounds like, oh, my yeah. God, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm up there with coffee. And, you know, Jeff is not an early riser, but it's actually like it's one of the best things that we have ever done. You get so much back <laughs> from giving. I mean, it's like it's like extraordinary, actually. And the connections mm -hmm. you make, reconnections you make are powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just very quickly, one last quest question is, uh, how has outreach affected your work? We're here today and we've made a neuron, but have you found that you've, you've, you've been uh, inhibited or have you found other ways? And it has to be a quick answer, I'm afraid. We have loads of questions, but this is, this is really down to, the, down to the wire. It's made us better educators, I think, because you're in many, many more settings um, and you're you know, developing more kind of outreach skill that can be, you're communicating with like a lot more people 
Um, so you mm -hmm. you and you and you're finding you're enjoying all these experiences as well. So you're you're motivated to continue. Uh, so it's been very beneficial in terms of our our career as educators, right? So yeah, for sure. Okay, well, it, it just leaves me to say thank you very much. Thank you for for showing me how to do this. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and say so thank you to the audience, both for watching the webinar today, but also for submitting all these questions. And we hope that we can get back to you with questions. Um, we will close with a short survey after this, and we encourage and really appreciate your feedback so that we can continue improving BrainFacts uh, webinars. Um, if you have more questions after the webinar, please submit them. Please complete the survey. And thank you once again to Bill and Jeff. I think it was absolutely fabulous and really, really enjoyed uh, the whole session. We hope you did too. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.